and begin to make something out of that and turn it into something that's, that's many times worth a lot of money, amen, and certainly something that is precious to the, the, the man that's doing the work on the wood, amen. Hallelujah. A lot of work is put into the, to the vessel by the potter and a lot of work is put into the wood by the craftsman and it means something to them. God puts a lot of work into you. Amen. Hallelujah. He's always or He does mean what well, takes a lot of work. Some of us have more rough edges than others and He has to work on us more. Amen. Hallelujah. But <clears throat> He works on us and He molds us and shapes us into what He would have us to be. And I'm so thankful this morning that He didn't throw the clay away. Hallelujah. I want to talk for just a few minutes about what we discussed last Sunday. <laughs> last Sunday we talked about the fact that in the day that we live in, there seems to be some kind of a misconception that you can accept Jesus, you can be born again, and nothing happens. Nothing changes in your life. And this has been accepted by most of the church world because most of them live in a fantasy land that, that uh, preach a powerless salvation. They don't preach against sin or things like that. So there's no change that has to be made. There's no change. You can stay the same way you are. Just break a little Jesus in there. i got news for you. When Jesus comes into your life, something happens. We're not talking about, as I said last Sunday morning, we're not talking about sinless perfection, but we're talking about something has changed in you. If you see no change at all, then the gospel that you preach apparently is powerless. But I want to talk to you this morning about something. And I want to name this sermon Circumstantial Evidence. I did a little looking up on this, and most of us know this already because you've watched enough episodes of Matlock or Perry Mason and you know what circumstantial evidence is. And to tell you the truth, I have struggled the last couple of weeks in how to preach the subject that the Lord has us on because this is something that when you preach it, many, not all, but many people today will point at you and call you judgmental. You're judging their heart. You don't know their heart. You don't know, you, know, you can't say what kind of condition they're in. You're not their judge. God is their judge. But I want to talk to you about circumstantial evidence. I'm going to try to do this as delicate as possible without hurting anybody's feelings. Circumstantial evidence is things that point you to a conclusion that may or may not have happened. This is one definition for it. Pertinent, but not essential and possibly incidental. Now, for instance, I'll give you an example for this. Brother Tyler's walking along the sidewalk out here and he hears a gunshot inside the post office. And he runs into the post office and there lays a man that's been shot. Nobody else, just the man. The gun's laying there. And Brother Tyler walks over and picks up the gun. And the minute he picks up the gun, Brother Sleese runs in. Now, what does Brother Sleese see? He sees the man dead on the floor. He sees Brother Tyler standing there holding the smoking gun. So Brother Sleese testifies that he arrived and there he said, he didn't actually see the shooting, but he saw Brother Tyler with the gun. That is what you call circumstantial evidence. It's things that didn't, not, not, that are not from the, the exact time and, and when it happened, but surrounding events that lead you to a conclusion that, well, it must have been him that did it. Because I ran in, didn't see nobody else. I saw Brother Tyler, he had the gun. So he must have done it. So that's circumstantial evidence today. You saw him in church. You saw him go through the motions. Or maybe you saw him go down to the altar. But there is more than a reasonable doubt today as to whether he really got saved because all the evidence is circumstantial because if they tried him for being a Christian, there would not be enough evidence to convict him. Amen? We've got all kinds of people confessing that they've been that they're saved. You have, I guarantee you, if we went out here on the street today and Brother Rodney took the camera like some of the TV shows do and I took the mic and we interviewed people, 85 or 90% of the people in Livermore are saved. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. 85 or 90% of them are more. Yeah. They're saved. They believe in God. They're ready to go. You can't 
judge them. Doesn't matter what kind of lifestyle they're living. Alcoholic, dope addict, homosexual, harlot, whatever the case may be. You can't judge me. But the Bible teaches us differently. The Bible teaches us that with real salvation comes proof that something has taken place in your life. But we don't see that. We don't hear that being preached from our pulpits today. And someone asked the question once, if you were tried for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Amen? And you can say you don't know my heart. You can't know whether I'm saved. You cannot judge me. You're not my judge. God is my judge. And there's a lot of truth in what you're saying. But let me bring it down to where you can understand it. If I spend enough time with you, if you spend enough time with me, that which is in our heart will make its way to the surface. Amen? If the only time I see you is at church, I may not know. Because most people act religious at church. Not all of them. But the majority of people act religious at church. If the only time I see you is on Sunday morning and Tuesday night or whatever time you have service, if that's the only time I see you, then from that I may draw the conclusion that you're saved. You're at church. You have your hands lifted up. But when I walk with you throughout the week, when I work with you throughout the week, when I fellowship with you throughout the week, if I spend enough time with you, if you spend enough time with me, like Hank used to say, your cheating heart will tell on you. Amen? Sooner or later. Oh, you can fool some people. You can fool a lot of people. Amen? And many have. But sooner or later, that which is in your heart will make its way to the surface. If you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you were born again the way the Bible preaches being born again, yet there is no change whatsoever in your attitude. There is no change whatsoever in the fruit that you bear. There is no change whatsoever in the walk that you walk. There is no change at all except for the fact now you've sprinkled a little religion in your life to go along with all the other things that you were doing. If that's all there is, if what you got ain't enough to make a difference, you ain't got much. Yeah. Amen? Let me say that again. Brother Tyler, if what you got this morning is not enough for somebody to be able to tell you got something, you ain't got much. Amen? If the only way somebody knows that you're born again and a follower of Jesus is simply because if you tell them, yeah. because they can't tell by the way you walk, they can't tell by the way you talk, they can't tell by the way you live, they can't tell by your actions, then something is wrong somewhere. Yeah. Something is wrong somewhere in your walk with God. Because if you hang around long enough, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, amen, sooner or later, your heart will tell on you. Last week we talked about the Apostle Paul. And we talked about his miraculous conversion. We talked about how that he, and all of us know this, that he was a person, but there may be someone out there that doesn't know this. We're not just preaching to those in here today, but we're preaching to those all around the world that might tune into this. The Apostle Paul whose name was Saul at the time, was a persecutor of the church. He officiated over the deaths of Christians. He thought he was doing God a service by stamping out this false cult, this uprising, that were following this blasphemer, Jesus, that they had nailed to the cross. So on his road to Damascus, the Lord appears, knocks him off of his horse, and he has a vision of Jesus. He says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And Saul, when he was converted, when he was born again, didn't get up the same man he was when he had an experience with Jesus. Read accounts of salvation in the Word of God, and you will find out that when they were born again, Brother Rodney, they were not the same people. Were they perfect? No. Were they sinless? No. Did they have some growing to do? Yes. But something changed in their life. If you went to church this morning and you went down and you repeated the prayer after the preacher,
preacher and you shook his hand and you got his your name on his book but you walked out and you continued to be exactly the same as you were before then you're saying that being born again Jesus moving in made no difference in your life whatsoever then you're not preaching the Christ of the Bible because if you read over there where he got a hold of Paul you'll see that he was different when you talk about Zacchaeus you'll find out that he was different whenever you talk about the woman at the well you'll find out she was different the woman they called an adultery you'll find out there was a change that took place when Jesus comes into your heart when you are born when you get more than listen it is possible today to get religion and stay the same but it is impossible for Jesus to come into your life and not make a difference amen it's impossible for Jesus to come into your life and not make a difference Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 5 and 7, see, that's what we're preaching today, that we were seeing in our modern day mega churches a powerless gospel. Yeah. One that may appease your conscience but doesn't change your life. There you go. Amen? Yeah. It might make Sleece Butler feel a little bit better yeah. about Sleece Butler, yeah. but it will not change your life from the inside out. Mm -hmm. But Jesus does change. With Jesus, there comes a change. Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Was Paul speaking of sinless perfection? No. Read the rest of his writings. And you'll find out he was not speaking of that. He himself, a born again, spirit filled believer, struggled with things. We all struggle with things. Amen? None of us are perfect. And I know that. I know this was a born again experience that takes place in the heart of man. But with salvation, when we are born again, we go from life unto death. Jesus moves in. He takes residence inside these old vessels of clay. And if you're telling me that all of that can happen on the inside of you and nobody see nothing, nobody can tell a difference that something's wrong with the experience that you had with Jesus. There's something's wrong with your experience. Maybe you didn't have no experience with Jesus. Amen? Because Jesus makes a difference. Jesus makes a difference today. Amen? When He comes into your heart, when He moves in, if you see you may stand there and say, but nothing changed. Nothing happened. I don't feel any different. I don't, and I know it's not a feeling. That's not the kind of feeling I'm talking about. I don't live any different. I don't, I don't, there's nothing changed in me. Well, then it's impossible for Jesus to have moved in. Because when Jesus moves in, something happens inside of you. Something happens in your life. There are proofs that people are Christian, that people have received Jesus today. The Bible says you will know them by their fruit that they bear. See, a tree is known by its fruit. We could go down here today and there could be an orange tree at the, down here at the end of the road and you could point at it all day and say, that's an orange tree. That's an orange tree. That's an orange tree. I wouldn't know it unless I saw an orange hanging on it. Amen? An orange tree could stand there and proclaim, I'm an orange tree! But unless you're just... Unless you're a tree nerd or whatever they call it. Unless you're somebody that knows a tree just by looking at the leaves and the bark or whatever, however you figure that out. You wouldn't know it unless you see some oranges hanging on that tree. I'm dumb this morning. If I was walking out in the country, I'd know a pear tree if I saw some pears hanging on it. I'd know an apple tree if I saw some apples hanging on it. I'd know an orange tree if I saw some oranges hanging on it. Amen? And Jesus said that you'll know one another by the fruit that you bear. Amen? Brother Billy, did he really say that? Oh yeah, Matthew 7, 15 and 16. Matthew the 7th chapter, the 15th and 16th verse, Jesus said this, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly, they are ravening wolves. Now listen to that. They look right on the outside. But inside, they ain't good. They ain't right. They look like they're professing to be something that they're not. But listen to what Jesus says. He lets us know that their fruit will bear them out because He says that inwardly, they are ravening wolves. Verse 16 says, Ye shall know them by their fruits. Did you hear what He's saying? He's talking about, He's comparing man to a tree 
And his actions, the things that happen, the things that proceed from his life, the things that he does, he compares that to fruits. You will know them by their fruits. How can I know them by their fruits unless I see their fruits? If your fruits are only hidden and they are hidden, what kind of fruit is that? The, 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 if, if today the, the only proof that we have that you are right with God or that you're born again or that you've had an experience with Jesus is the fact that you tell us but we see no proof there is no there has been no change in your life there is no fruit there is no works there is nothing then more than likely you need to go back and examine yourself and make sure you got what it is you're proclaiming that you got because if whatever you have is not enough to change your life you do not have much Matthew 12 and 33 Jesus said either make the tree good and his fruit good or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. Did you hear that? Then he said in Luke 6 and 44, for every tree is known by his fruit. Are you seeing something here? Jesus is telling us. You can stand today and say that don't judge me. You don't know my heart. Sooner or later our heart will Make itself known. Sooner or later, our heart... See, works and fruit are not something that you do in order to reach to salvation because salvation is by grace, it's through faith. But once you are born again, once you are born again, Jesus brings forth the fruit and the works in your life. So once we're saved... Once we're true, truly biblically saved, something changes inside of us. We begin to, and like I said, we won't be perfect. You'll struggle with some things. Many of you out there may struggle with a lot of things. But you know that something is different in your life. You're not happy that you struggle. You're not satisfied with the sin that remains in your life. You're not content with the sin that still remains. Heard someone say this past week. They were praying. And they said, Lord, you know how I feel. You know these feelings that I have. But I don't want to feel this way. I don't want these things inside of me. I don't want to feel this way. I'm not happy with sin. I'm not comfortable with sin. <laughs> As a born-again believer, you will bring forth fruit. Some 30, some 60, and some 100 folks. Some Christians are more fruitful than others. You can't measure everybody else's by maybe someone that's bringing forth 100-fold fruit. And because someone's bringing forth 30-fold, you say, well, they just, they're not saved. That's not true. Some 30, some 60, and some 100-fold. There are different levels. See, that's where we get into our spiritual growth, which is not being taught from our pulpits today. When you're born again, you're a baby in Christ. You're going to fall. Look at it in the natural. That's why God, that's why the Lord uses those kind of that time, that kind of terminology so we can understand it. Every one of us have seen a baby. We know that that baby, whenever it is first born, it does not jump out of its mother's womb and start running around the room and say, Give me a piece of steak. That baby is a baby. It has to grow. It, it'll crawl before it walks. Amen? It'll slobber all over the place. It'll mess in its diaper. Amen? It'll have to have the nipple. It'll cry a lot. Amen? It'll cry and it'll, it'll throw some fits. Amen? <laughs> it'll throw some fits, Brother Rodney. So when, those, when, a, when a baby acts that way, you don't think anything about it. It's a baby. It's just a baby. When a baby messes in its diaper, many times they say, oh look, you did a poo-poo. And some people say, it's cute. You know, some people think it's cute, some of the things a baby does. But let me tell you this. If you're still doing that 30 years later, it ain't cute no more. Something is wrong, amen? I changed Brother Tyler's diapers whenever he was little. I fed him his bottle whenever he was little. I put him on my shoulder and burped him when he was little. If I was still having to do that today, something is seriously wrong with him. People that are claimed to be born again, they very well may be. They may 
may be born again. Let me, re let me rephrase that. Christians today that have been saved for years still come to church in their dirty diapers, uh, sucking on their nipple and throwing a fit every time they don't get their way. There is no spiritual growth today in the body of Christ because preachers ain't preaching about spiritual growth. What you get from those mega preachers is that once you're born again, that's it. You can have your best life now. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. You've entered in. It's over. It's finished. No, it's just begun. There is a spiritual growth that takes place whenever you become born again. You don't stay a baby all the time. And I don't have time to go into all of that this morning, but the Apostle Paul talked to some people and he said, you should be eating meat right now. Yeah. But because you're still a baby, I got to give you milk. Amen. And we're seeing that today by the groves, the masses. Because we see preachers pushing a doctrine of a salvation that makes no change in anyone's life. A, we see preachers not preaching against sin, not preaching that there is a growing up in God, that you don't have that, that once you are born again, your journey has just begun. And now there is depths in God and heights in God. And now you can grow into mature into a mature Christian. No, they just spend more. They just spend more time handing out diapers, diaper wipes, and bottles. Amen. Stay the way you are. Stay dependent upon me. Amen. If you're dependent upon me, I can control you. But Jesus, when He comes in, He makes a difference. And you will begin as you grow. You will begin to produce fruit. And if you never grow, if you never produce fruit, you're walking a dangerous line today. Jesus would say in John 15 and 1, John 15 and 1, Jesus said, I am the vine. I am the true vine. I'm sorry. My Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Did you hear that? Many times in our walk as we bear fruit, we go through times of purging. Now purging for a tree is not that pleasant of an experience. In the end, it all works together for the good of the tree. But sometimes you have to get in there and cut out the old dead branches. Sometimes you have to get in there and get some of the old dead weight out in order for new life to come. In order for it to be more fruitful. Amen? Brother Hinton used to tell about Brother Ronnie Dane came out to his house and he had a grape harbor out in the back. I remember sitting out there one summer and Brother Hinton picking grapes off and me and him sitting there eating them. He said, Brother Ronnie, he said it looked like it was dying and it just wasn't putting out very much fruit. It was putting out some fruit, but just not as much as it could. It wasn't redoing its potential. So Brother Ronnie Dave came out there and he took the cutters to it. <laughs> and he cut and he cut and Brother Ed said he didn't think he's ever going to get done cutting. He said when Brother Ronnie left, he thought he's killed it. There ain't nothing left. Yeah. But the next year, he put out more grapes than it ever had before. Because of the purging that took place. We don't like being on the potter's wheel where the pressure's on and he's putting pressure with his hands. But that pressure is necessary to be for us to be formed into the image that he wants us to be. That pressure and that trial that you're going through is necessary so that you'll bring forth more fruit. And Jesus says that that which beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now this, this is what I want to get to. Listen. Drop down to verse 5. I am the vine, talking about Jesus. You are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. You can't help if you begin to grow in Jesus. Once you're born again, if you don't get into that stalemate, that place of contentment where you think I don't have anymore, I don't want anymore, I'm satisfied with just what I've got. And you may in the end be saved and so is by fire, but I wouldn't want to chance it. But anyway, Jesus he teaches us here, if we will press on to know, if we will grow in Him, if we will pray, if we will seek Him, 
If we'll have a prayer life, if we'll read and study the Word of God, we begin to grow spiritually. And that work of grace in our lives begins to bring forth fruit. We will begin to bear fruit in our lives. So if they tried you for being a Christian today, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Would it all be circumstantial? Well, he goes to church. He says he is, and, but, but there's nothing else. There's no proof. There's no rock hard solid evidence. There's no fruit. There's no works. And we know today that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against us there is no law. And in turn, when you begin to have these fruits in your life, they will be borne out through good works. Say, Brother Billy, how do you know this? I know this because Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Did you hear what he said? That they may see your good works. He already told us over here in these other scriptures that you will know them by the fruit that they bear, meaning you will see their fruit. Here he says that men may see your good works because once we begin to grow spiritually, once we begin to mature as a Christian and we begin to get more of Him, more of His Word, a closer walk with the Lord, then that, that grace that saved us will do even greater, not, not greater works than salvation. We'll farther, we'll, we'll further the work. I'll get it out in a minute. We'll further the work that He has begun in us. Amen? He will further that work and we will begin to grow and we will begin to... You see, little saplings do not bring forth fruit. They're a tree. They look puny and they're all flimsy and stuff, but they're a tree. A sapling, in a, way, in a sapling stage, but when it begins to grow, once it gets big enough, then it begins to bear fruit. That's the place the Lord wants us to get to. We can do this by leaning on Him, trusting on Him, drawing from Him. He said He is the vine. We are the branches. He is the tree. It's from Him that we get our life. It's from His finished work that we rely on. And listen to me, I'm not preaching works this morning. We are not saved because of good works. Good works is a, good works is a product of salvation. You don't bear fruit to be saved. You don't do good works to be saved. Those things come because you are saved. Now, Brother Billy, you, you might say today, you might say, Brother Billy, you know that a lot of people do good works and they're not saved. And that's true. It is possible to do good works without being born again. But it is impossible to be born again and not do good works. Did you hear what I said? It is possible today for you to put on the facade on the outside and your heart be cro crooked. The, the Pharisees did that. The Sadducees did that. But it is impossible for your heart to be right and for you to keep it hidden. Because just as, just as well as your evil heart, your wicked heart, your cheating heart will tell on you, so will your born again man that's inside of you. You try to keep it here, but your closest friends will think there's something different about him. It'll begin to surface. If you really get a hold of Jesus, Jesus really gets a hold of you, something takes place in your life. Something takes place because it's possible to do good works without Jesus inside. It is impossible not to do good works with Jesus in your heart. In 2 Corinthians 3 and 3, there were some people demanding proof that Christ was speaking through Paul. And Paul tells them in 2 Corinthians 13 and 5, to examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you? Except ye be reprobates. So he says, examine yourself. Whether you be in the faith or not. James would say, faith without works is dead. 
If the faith that you have produces no works, you may need to examine the faith that you have because true faith in Jesus Christ will produce something. Something will come forth of that. It is impossible to be born again and still be the same old way that you were before. Will you still have some of the same struggles? Possibly so. Will you still struggle with certain things in your life? Possibly so. But something took place inside of you and you know it. There's a change. There's a change. Otherwise, if you believe that salvation brings about no change, that Jesus coming into your heart brings about no change, that you can accept Christ and nothing changes, then you believe a powerless salvation and that's not the salvation of the Bible. Jesus Christ can change your life. He's not just a ticket to heaven. He can change your life here on earth. You don't have to live in the same gloom, despair, misery, and agony and just look forward to the day that you cross over the river into eternity so you can have peace. No, Jesus can give you peace now if you get a hold of the right Jesus, the real Jesus. Amen. Jesus can give you contentment now. He can change your life. You don't have to stay miserable. You don't have to stay afraid. You don't have to stay undone and broken today. You don't have to stay bound by alcohol. We've got people in pews of our churches every Sunday. Alcoholics, dump addicts, people addicted to drugs, people addicted to alcohol. But when Jesus, and, and the only thing that changed is they went to church, they said a few words, they signed a book, they shook the preacher's hand, and that's it. And they don't know any difference because the preacher doesn't preach on sin. The preacher doesn't preach on spiritual growth. He just gives them something to feel good about themselves each Sunday morning. They go through the week and they get down. And they might even begin to feel a little conviction. Listen to me. I'm fixing the clothes. They might even feel a little conviction when they come into the house of God on Sunday morning. But by the time the preacher gets through making them feel so good about themselves, they brush that conviction off. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Oh, can I say that again? They might have, through the week, when they continued their old sinful lifestyle, they might have begun to feel their heart being pricked by the Holy Spirit. They might have begun to feel a little conviction. Amen? They might have felt a little bad about it till they went to church Sunday morning and the preacher stood in the pulpit for his 30 minutes and delivered them their self-help, feel-good message, and then by that time they walked out of there feeling, well, that was just condemnation. I'd walk out of here feeling good, go right back into the same sin I was in before I came into church this morning. Nothing about spiritual growth. Nothing about laying aside the sin and the weight that does so easily, the weight and the sin that does so easily beset you. Nothing about growing up in Christ and not staying a baby anymore. And these preachers that do this are working against the working of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit is convicting. Mm -hmm. Brother Tyler goes through the week and he does things. I can name off some things, but whatever it is in his life, and he's he's living a a life that's not pleasing to God and he's doing things that's not pleasing to God that goes against his word. And he begins to feel conviction over it. God's trying to deal with his heart. And then he comes into church on Sunday morning and the preacher stands up there. You're okay. I'm okay. God wants nothing but the best for you. We're all okay. Brother Tyler begins to feel like, well, what I felt this week must have just been my old flesh. That just must have been condemnation. Because, you know, what I've been taught when I was a kid or something. By the time he gets out of there, he's not feeling that conviction anymore. Because that preacher, if you call him that, and I use that term loosely this yeah, morning, really. that preacher stood in the pulpit until he preached your conviction away by telling you you're okay, I'm okay, we're all okay, God loves everybody, and everybody's going to make it. Yeah. Doesn't preach about hell, doesn't preach about sin, doesn't preach about growing up in God. Mm -hmm. So he preaches your conviction right off your shoulders. Mm -hmm. yeah. You brush it off and walk out and go right back into the same way you are. That's why you love to go to his church. Yeah. Amen? Mm -hmm. That's why you stay away from that little storefront church down there on Main Street that preaches on sin, that believes that you can't live like the devil and still go to heaven. Amen? That believes that there's a change that takes place inside of your life, that there will be fruit that follows salvation and the finished work. You're putting your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. You don't want to go there.
because when you come in feeling convicted on Sunday morning and the Word is preached and the Spirit begins to move, you might find yourself down at the altar repenting. You might find yourself there and you're saying, Oh God, help me. Help me to do better. I know I didn't do good this week. Help me to put my faith exclusively in You and to live the life that You'd have me to live. Live this life through me, Jesus. I'm weak. I can't do it on my own. You are the vine. I'm the branch. I've got to have You in order to bear fruit. I've got to have You in order to have this life. That's why you stay away from there. I think I'll go down yonder to the mega church because they make me feel good. Think about that. They make me feel good. By the time he gets through preaching, I don't feel bad at all. I don't feel changed. I'm the same way as I was, but I feel better about the way that I am. Yeah. Amen. I feel better about the way that I am. The salvation that the Bible teaches us makes a difference. We always hear in the, in the Pentecostal movement anyway, we hear about the evidence of, of the Holy Ghost. The evidence is, is speaking in tongues. What about the evidence of salvation today? You never hear anybody saying anything about the evidence of salvation because they say, now wait a minute. You're judging me. That's works. No, I'm not talking about works before salvation. I'm talking about a salvation that will produce fruit. I'm talking about a salvation that will make a difference in your life. I'm not talking about some dead salvation today. I'm talking about there, can, there is evidence of salvation. And I know that there are many, many Christians who stay a baby for a long time. They're saved. You can tell. You know that they are when you get around them. You can tell that there has been a change in their life. But they're still a baby. They were born, but they're still a baby. And I lay the blame at the feet of pastors today, of people that sit on our pews that have been born again and they've been a baby for 10 years. They've been a baby for 15 years. They've been a baby for 20 years. They've been a baby for 25 years. They've been a baby for 30 years. Amen? They haven't grown any. And I lay that a lot of that blame on preachers today because of not preaching of the change that salvation brings. Not preaching about works and fruit that come after salvation. That come after salvation. Now listen to me. And I'm closing, I promise. Ephesians 2 and 8. We all know this Scripture by heart. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Can we read on? The next verse says this. You never hear this one. Or not as much anyway. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Now, did you hear what I said? We are created in Christ Jesus, not because of good works that we did before that. We are created... In Christ Jesus, unto good works. Meaning good works will follow when this takes place in our life. Fruit will follow when this takes place in our life. If we begin to grow, if we begin to mature, first off, there will be a change of some kind. I'm not telling you be sinless. I'm not telling you you won't get up and go home and struggle with some of the stuff you struggled before. But I'm telling you there will be a change. Jesus makes a change. And if you tell me today that Jesus makes no change, then I don't believe in the Jesus you believe in. Amen? The Jesus that I believe in makes a change in your life. He, is, he has the power when He comes inside of you to make a change in your life. Amen? So there will be a change. And then as you grow, get, into, get in a church where you can feed on the Word of God and you can grow. Where your faith will grow. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Get you an old-fashioned King James Bible. Oh, what a blessing it was last Sunday to hear. I might have said this last Sunday. No, I think I listened to it Sunday night. But anyway, to hear Donnie Swaggart, I know I did. Brother Donnie Swaggart on SBN, national television, all around the world, stand there and defend the King James Bible. Amen. First time I ever heard anything like that on any Christian network. Amen. Get you a Bible. A word-for-word -word translation, and this is it. None of the rest of them out there is it. The rest of them are paraphrased. The rest of them are drawn from conclusion. The rest of them are brought from corrupt text. So get you a Bible and read it. You don't matter whether you understand it or not, read it anyway. When you were in school, when I was in school, I read a lot of things I didn't understand. They give me that science book, and I and I'm like, man, I don't, I don't get none of that stuff. Read it. Sooner or later, you'll get it. 
Amen. Sooner or later, you'll get it. So read it. I encourage you today. Find you a church that's preaching the Word of God. Preaching the Bible. Amen. Get you a Bible and read it for yourself. Have a prayer life. Seek God. Ask the Lord to do a work in you. And you'll begin to grow. And then, this salvation that we're talking about, that comes by grace, through faith, then it will be unto good works. It will produce good works. It will produce good works. The salvation that we've been preaching about the last two Sundays makes a difference in your life. Jesus, Jesus makes a difference in your life. This used to, you didn't have to used to hammer on this so much, at least not in the Bible Belt, because when people preached about Jesus, they preached that He'd change your life. There would be a change. You would see old drunks come in and fall down to the altar. We saw people through the years that was drunk when they went down to the altar and sober when they got up. People that were bound by sin that got set free at an old-fashioned altar. But now our altars are covered up with flyers, whatnots, and glass angels and beans. Yeah, one place had a pot of beans on theirs. Now we've got that, and now all we have is all. Everybody, repeat after me. One man even done it to wear that. How many people in here want to be saved today? And one man raised up his hand and he said, "Praise the Lord! Give the Lord a hand. We just had one born again." No repentance. No change. Amen? If you have more faith in the prayer than you do the one you're praying in, your faith's in the wrong place. So let me encourage you today to read God's Word. Let me encourage you to pray. Let me encourage you to find you a Bible-preaching church and get in it. But Mama went to this church. I don't care who went to that church. If it's dead, get out of it. If they're not preaching the truth of the Word of God, get out of it. Find you somewhere that's preaching, but they don't have the choir. They don't have the program. Throw the choir and the programs out the window. If you got Jesus and the Word of God, that's what's going to make you grow. The Spirit, the anointing. I don't care if it's 10. I don't care if it's 10,000. If that's where the Spirit is at and they're preaching the truth of the Word of God, get in there and grow. Get in there and grow. I want to encourage you today to let you know there is more than what you got when you went down and shook the preacher's hand and you went back to your seat the same way that you were before. Still is miserable. Still is ungodly. Still is sinful. Still as, 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 as miserable as a harlot on the front pew. No peace. No joy. There's more to it than that. All you got was religion. All you got was religion. You don't have to be the same. You can have joy and peace and you don't have to wait to heaven to get it. Amen? What Jesus offers is not some lifeless, powerless profession. It is a life-changing experience in Him. What He offers is relationship. Not just in Jesus whom Paul preaches, but you can know Jesus for yourself. Right. You can know Jesus for you. This is a personal walk, Brother yeah. Sleece. Amen? Yeah. Brother Sleece don't have to come to me in order to get to Jesus. Jesus is with Brother Sleece. Amen? Jesus wants to live inside of you. He wants to take up residence inside of you. And when He moves in, you will know it. Amen? Something will change. You won't be like one day, well, well you know, Jesus moved in and I didn't even know it. He must have snuck through the back door. No, 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 no. He makes a difference, Brother Tyler. Jesus makes a difference in your life. Jesus, not sinless perfection, but a difference. Not, but a difference. Amen. He makes a difference. He, is, he has the power to change your life today. Someone else this morning have something before we go.